see. you have, yeah, and yeah, then okay. All right, let me um, just I'll just take over then and start sharing. Hopefully, you can see my screen. I hope. Yep. Yep. Okay. So, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, Power BI break session. Uh, we are going to be talking about composite models. And as we've recently found out, there'll be some bonus material as well. <laughs> so as in recently, as in five minutes ago, we found out. So this will be great. Uh, so we're really pleased to welcome um, two kind of program managers from uh, Microsoft. We have Jay Tahiet, and I'll probably pronounce that terribly, so I apologize if I have, and, and Jana Berkovic. And there's a little bit of words there around um, some profile information we took from LinkedIn. I'm sure they'll introduce themselves a little bit shortly. Uh, and we have the two kind of hosts for this session as well. Uh, so we have Catherine, um, who is doing a lot of the work here uh, to get all these things set up. Um, there's a lot of information about Catherine. And if you've ever seen any kind of Power BI logos and things like that, then a lot of those will be dr certainly drawn by Catherine. Um, and she's been obviously involved in Power BI a lot and Power BI days and organizing the Power BI breaks and running them. Um, and as myself, uh, I don't have anything that exciting to say at the minute. So uh, I'm based in Ireland. Um, I'm a Power BI power user, probably not a developer. I'm not hands on all the time, but I do from time to time. Uh, and I'm responsible for Power BI in our organization. We have around about 250 people creating content and around about 1700 people who are consuming content. So what I will do is I'll stop presenting um, and I'll give control back to um, I think Jay is starting first. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So you take it away, Jay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Let me just minimize my little team screen here, and then we're good to go. There we go. <coughs> okay. Well, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, great to see so many of you here on the call. Um, so many languages, both on Nederlanders or Gluck. So I had to say some Dutch here because I recognized a lot of the Dutch names. Um, I'm uh, Jeroen or Jay for short. I work as a program manager in the Power BI team. And today I'm joined with my colleague, uh, Jana, who can probably introduce herself better than I can. Hi, I'm Jana. I'm a program manager in uh, BAG, uh, business application group, and I am doing the instructor-led training. So dashboard in a day, up in a day, and other training for the Power Platform. Uh, feel free to reach out. And I was uh, welcomed by Jay and Catherine to join this session. So thank you. Cool. And today we'll talk about a couple of things. We'll talk about uh, quickly to give you some insight into how the team in uh, for Power BI is organized, how we actually build Power BI. Um, so that will help you understand a little bit where people come from. If you talk to them like, hey, I work on Blah team, then you kind of understand what they do. Um, we'll talk about composite models. We'll talk about what's new and exciting. And if time permits, we'll also cover the AI visuals. And uh, there will be time for questions after the session and probably just after the composite models part. Um, so feel free to chat uh, and you know line up any questions in the chat. And we'll hand it over to Catherine and, and uh, at, at some point, and Gavin at some point to kind of ask those questions, uh, um, you know, generally. Um, so with that, let's get let's just get started. Um, so first, how is Power BI built at Microsoft? There's a couple of teams um, here, and the the first thing that I noticed, I'm not this this long in this team. I, I joined in April. What I noticed is that I always thought there were so many people on the team, but Honestly, it's not that many. <laughs> if you just look at, for example, Power BI Desktop, right? There's only, um, let's see, six, five, six PMs on it, which is program managers like us deciding, um, trying to decide on the future of the product. And then you have some software engineers, which is normally more than one per PM, um, that then take those uh, ideas of what where the product should go and they build something entirely different. Uh, that's kind of how this works, right? So, so you design something in a certain direction, and the software engineer builds something else. Now, I'm just joking, but basically, that's that's the two roles you have. You have software engineers, and you have program managers. Program managers are the ones that try to set out the the, the goals, the plans, the the way forward, and the software engineers are the people that actually write the software. 
Um, so we have teams in the US and we have teams in Israel. Um, so, and in the US, we have a little bit more teams than in Israel. Our, our, you know, our footprint in Israel is slightly uh, uh, lower. Um, and in the US, we have product teams, uh, some central teams, and I don't know what you want to call them, uh, uh, Jana, but the back operations team is, that's probably also a very important team, but not central in, in the sense that it is not Thank around. You, Jay. But, <laughs> Just joking. Um, so product teams, for example, um, I'm part of one of the product teams. I'm on, on, in the self-service team where I focus on on trying to accelerate self-service growth. So that's, for example, where we built Power BI Desktop. That's where we think about the whole self-service story for people around when they use Power BI in the service and in the desktop. Um, we have enterprise BI and AI. That's where we focus logically, as you can see in, in the team title, on the enterprise scenario. So, so for example, um, analysis services and the, how do we integrate with analysis services is all part of that story. How do we do, um, you know, how do we create and grow Power BI into this full platform from self-service all the way to enterprise? How do we work on uh, an integration with Power BI report server, for example? Those kind of things are there. And then the service platform is where we actually build the scalable platform where you can see uh, and publish those Power BI reports to. And this is where we design and build that platform so it will scale with you and actually still keep working while you're while you're busy using it. Um, so that's the US teams. As I said, I'm in the self-service team. Um, you know, my 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 advice to you would be ask anybody whenever you talk to them in the Power BI team. In which team are you really? Because then you can kind of plot what their agenda is and what their frame of mind is, where they want to go to, right? Um, in Israel, we have a couple teams. We have um, the enterprise information management team. They do a lot about around security, enterprise security, Microsoft information protection. Um, in the service, they do, for example, the lineage view that you might recognize from the service, um, the impact analysis, uh, those kind of things are, are developed there. Um, also, our developer team is there, so the ones that work on Power BI Embedded and the API layer for that you can use as an external developer, um, the custom visuals that you can create for Power BI, all of that software to enable that scenario is built in Israel. And of course, mobile, which is the I think the the most popular uh, mobile application in any app store for BI is Power BI Mobile, so that's great. Uh, it has the best re uh, best reviews. That's all also built from from Israel as well. Uh, in the US, we have a couple of central teams. Our CTO teams are are sitting here, planning and operations um, are also here. And then we have the back operations and customer success, where Jana sits, and she can probably tell better what they do. Okay, so thank you, Jay. So bag operations and customer success is for the entire pl power platform and for the Dynamics 365 for whoever is using that. And we are enabling and helping customers to um, to achieve success with those products, um, especially in my field, what I am focused on is content, instructor-led training. I also work with uh, Kelly K, for example, that enables and Fawad, who are enabled the community. So whoever is part of the community and registered to our community probably gets uh, across their names and across all the competitions, the fun uh, visual gallery, and so on. So we are, are enabling all those types of activities. And there are other components into the uh, operation and customer success. So whenever you are speaking with somebody who is from that team, uh, you are probably uh, can uh, you are probably a partner that uh, needs our support or wants to help us with uh, enabling new products, for example, or uh, new features and trainings. So I am from that team, and as I mentioned before, I am uh, responsible to develop all the training for in a day program. So uh, Catherine here is one of our uh, proudest uh, instructors of the in a day program and partners and I'm sure that there are more so uh, let me know in the chat who you are just to say hello and uh, that would be lovely if you are training uh, the diet or IAD or other other advanced data visualization advanced data modeling programs with us so thanks okay thank you Jana um, so let's go to the next uh, part of this this presentation. We'll talk about Power BI real quick. Uh, this slide will build up, but I don't think I have to go through all the details, but it's kind of a requirement to level set everybody. 
what we're talking about here, right? So the whole vision around Power BI, and that's also where composite models will come in, um, is about you know supporting all data. We're here to enable you to work with any data inside of your organization. It doesn't really matter in which silo it is, even the silos need to be, be broken down. And we want you, uh, we want to empower you using all the data to build your own better decisions, right? So that's basically the second thing is for everyone, where it's not just for higher management, it's not just for, for middle management or whatever, it's for everybody in any organization, even in your personal life. I once built a, bought a house using just Power BI analyzing all data. Right, so you can do that whatever scenario you might have. It's not organizational bound per se. And then for every decision, right? So as I said, not, not only CEO level, but also any, any organizational level, um, you could benefit from using data and powerful tools to analyze um, um, uh, and, and make better decisions. So that's our vision, uh, that's our goal. And of course, as you know, uh, when you use Power BI, there, there are certain areas where we are stronger. For example, Power BI came from the self-service world, so we're really growing into this enterprise world uh, and thinking about the integration uh, between the enterprise uh, software that you might be using and, and Power BI as a self-service tool. So together, that will marry somewhere in the future to one platform where all of the decisions, regardless if it's enterprise or self-service, um, will, be, will be based on. Uh, so that's our... Our goal. Um, I think we can go to the next topic here, which is what's new and exciting. Jana, take it away. Yes, thank you so much, Jay. So my fun example actually with Power BI is writing my resume in Power BI. Uh, try it out, like by years, countries, since I'm from Russia and Israel and Canada, and now in the US, uh, it was pretty interesting resume. So uh, go ahead and try it on your resume. It's very much fun. Uh, so what's new and exciting? So this is something I used to do for the Vancouver British Columbia user group uh, before I joined Microsoft every month to review everything that uh, came up this month or around this month and uh, tell the group what was uh, in the blog and other uh, features that were added to Power BI. Now for end of July and uh, the 24 days of August, there was just simply too much. So in five slides, one minute per slide, I'm going to review just parts that I thought are interesting, exciting, and so on, and I hope you keep up with me. So the first one in, is in reporting, and it's perspective support for uh, personalized visuals, and it is a preview feature. That means that you need to go to this uh, little settings inside your Power BI uh, report, uh, inside your Power BI desktop, and enable this preview feature. But it requires more than this pre uh, preview feature, and we will uh, get to it shortly. So this means that the re uh, report viewer, hence the end user, not the report designer, has more options to focus view, add measures. And, uh, can you go back just a second? Yeah, sorry about that. Add measure and dimensions into the uh, report and so on. And uh, uh, it, he can use the same report cubes and the uh, security is inherited. So there is nothing new there. The user is not compromising anything, but he uh, it is an additional feature to what was added back in May, which is the uh, visualis, uh, uh, which is the uh, more of an addition, tooltip and um, the different visualization. You can switch the bar chart and the area chart into to, for example, a line chart and so on. So this was added, but it requires something that is called tabular editor. Uh, you need to download the uh, tabular editor and create a new perspective. Of course, it's all in preview. Tabular editor was something that was added also about a, a month ago into Power BI on uh, end of July. And now I would need the next slide. You can find it uh, in the new ribbon, in, in the ribbon as a new ribbon section for external tools. The, in the external tools, you can download the tabular model, uh, the tabular editor, but you can also download other things such as Duck Studio. Most of you are already familiar with Duck Studio to uh, a, compl a complete tool for uh, Duck authoring. So whoever is writing Ducks probably is using uh, Duck Studio to diagnose and to write his Ducks properly, especially on complex Ducks. And now you can use it uh, inside Power BI and also ALM to Toolkit. 
uh, which is basically comparing data sets and uh, helping you with performance and uh, with other uh, advanced analytics that you can do on your data set inside your Power BI. So let's get back to Parabola Editor, not getting back to another slide, just in the same slide. You can see the first window is the screenshot of the tabular editor. It enables the BI professionals to easily build, maintain, and manage tabular models. What does it mean? You have got all your tables in there in Power BI, but you can also create um, something that is called perspective. A perspective will basically make sure that certain uh, fields from your table, measures, dimensions, can be viewed by uh, end user as well and added to the visuals. So this is after you are saving this uh, perspective inside your tabular model and exiting the tabular model in your uh, visualization page you will be able to enable this feature it will automatically appear for the ones who downloaded of course the preview uh, and enable the preview and uh, you can play with it uh, all along so this is a wonderful feature that i would recommend to try and preview uh, however try it at your own uh, it's written everywhere that you can try it at your own risk because it is still in a preview mode. So next uh, slide, please. <laughs> Okay, this one is a rectangular lasso selector for data points. Now, uh, this has a very, very cool name, but eventually, and I'm talking about not the animation, but the graph above, and eventually what happens is that you can select several data points. Before that, uh, a few months ago, we added the ability to select several visualization in order to easily copy and paste them and so on, after it was a feature that was requested quite a lot in our uh, Power BI uh, idea site. Now we can also select a few data points. As you can see from the line uh, from both of the line charts uh, a few dots were selected so you can see a couple of the blue and the purple dots uh, that are uh, appearing while the rest are not uh, appearing in there so this was also selected and you just hold the control key and with your mouse drag and select the area dots that you wish to um, to um, work with dynamic formatting support for more visuals uh, as you can see there are more dynamic formatting supports for all all the visuals I'm not going to read all of them but what I would recommend is please download the Power BI desktop for August and see what else you can do and evaluate which type of reports inside your organization it's time to upgrade or to give a new and glitzy look so next slide this one as I uh, this one is for dynamics and CRM and it's a uh, agile analysis for dynamics 365 before I say a few words about this visual I would like to emphasize the orange cloud that floats on top download new data gateway this month not every month we have a new data gateway just like not every month we have a new paginated report version but this month we do so please go and download it is important to your organization and you will probably need to uh, synchronize uh, several things down there. So uh, download the Power BI Gateway. Uh, the Dynamics World and the Power Apps and, and the Power out, uh, Apps World and the Power uh, BI World are uh, a bit separate, but this is one more way to uh, come uh, to make them together through this specific uh, template. Uh, what does it mean? That it easily connects to uh, Dynamics 365, and with this template, you already got those reports, uh, including the, the composition tree, for example, that an AI component that uh, we may or may not review today uh, that uh, is part of the template. How does it work? You download the template, you connect it to your Dynamics 365 and you publish it to your Power BI. So basically, uh, as long as you are the admin, uh, there should not be any problems with that. Uh, that uh, there are three new data connectivities and six new custom visuals, including a very beautiful pie chart, but I'm not going to display a pie chart because we all know what we think about pie charts. Uh, although those are 3D and very beautiful. And there are more uh, map updates. Um, there are more map updates, including maps with icons and maps that are doing shapes uh, around the um, places that you, that are the routes that you went through. So whoever has one of those uh, fancy watch trackers and can download the uh, data into Power BI and use one of those maps, uh, try, give it a try. I must say that it's quite interesting what you can achieve. Jay, take it back. 
<laughs> ah, one more slide on mobile. Sorry about that, so, because I lost my another minute. So what's new and exciting in mobile? The Israeli team is basically working on mobile and they did an amazing job. I lived in Israel for most of my life, so I'm proud. Uh, so uh, what happens is, first of all, there is a new share action. Um, that you can share your um, your report with uh, and your specific visual with your colleagues, and also there is an update for navigation. Another feature that was requested from Power BI Ideas for quite some time is to have a navigation both in my workspace and into the app. So now you can see those are separate navigations, and you and there is a clear indication where are you, what is the current web uh, app, what is the current section, and uh, what is the page that you are on it. So thank you, Power BI Mobile Team. All right, now, Jay, it's your turn. Thank you. <laughs> OK, let's get to composite models. And let's talk about um, what I like to think about is composite models, a tale of two kingdoms. Um, so in essence, when you think about where composite models matter is where you need to bridge um, corporate data and business side of data, right? So you have your corporate data warehouse and the cubes and all the rules around that, which is tri uh, tightly governed and strictly controlled, um, you're not allowed to do everything. You can just not download the whole thing and take it on a USB drive and share it around, there's rules. And then on the other side, there's self-service analytics where you have your Excel sheet, where you have maybe uh, a departmental database where you might have an external source. And really Composite Models is here to help you bridge those two worlds together. Uh, and we um, try to make that as easy as possible. Now, today, we already have composite models, right? We already have something that we call composite models. So let's look, look into what that is today. And then let's talk about what we want to uh, improve on that situation because there's still room for improvement. And, and we'll talk about that next. Um, so really composite models is the bridge between the IT and the self-service world, the enterprise and the self-service world. So today, if you use composite models, what you can do, you can basically mesh up any data from any source, where, regardless if it's import or direct query or live mode, it doesn't matter. You can just take all that data, mesh it together and create new value because you get more value if you add one and one because one and one equals three. We all know that. So that's where the composite models come in. You mesh data together, you, you wrap it in a nice bowl and you create, you create something cool. That's awesome. And we also need it for aggregations, by the way, but that's, it's there, right? Well, hold on. That's not entirely true because there's many sources and a couple in particular where we cannot use composite models today, right? For example, if you use SAP HANA, SAP BW, if you use SQL Server Analysis Services, if you use Azure Analysis Services, or if you want to try to get data from a Power BI data set, there is no composite models. End of story. If you connect to any of these, you cannot add more data. You cannot say, I'm going to connect to SQL Server Analysis Services, which happens to be one of the most popular queuing technologies in enterprises, or Azure Analysis Services. I'm going to connect to that and then I'll add an Excel sheet and then mesh them up together, create some magic. Uh uh, no way. It's not going to happen. It's not there. It doesn't work. And that's a problem because most enterprises use one of these. And the enterprise data is locked in one of these technologies. And then suddenly you got Power BI. So everything is great. And we told you that, you know, it can do whatever. You can mesh up this and that and you create magic. Well, no, because the data is in the, ent in the enterprise tools, one of these that are on the list here. And once you connect to them, there's no way back. You cannot extend. You cannot add any more data. And that's why we want to improve on that situation. So let's talk about composite models tomorrow for a given version of a uh, given value of tomorrow because I'm not allowed to tell you the deadline uh, when this will be available right now because that's shifting every day. Literally, that's shifting every day. Like every every week, there's another date where we want to go live with this. So I cannot even tell you. If I, even if I was allowed you, I couldn't. I couldn't tell. Um, so basically, what we want to do here is we want to improve over that situation. And the way we think about this is we think about two things in a, in a Power BI world. We think about enterprise semantic models, which is the IT side of the data. This is where your data warehouse sits. This is where your cube sits or your semantic layer around the data warehouse. 
and we think about the local model, which is in essence everything that you do inside of Power BI Desktop. And those two things are, are disconnected, right? Um, IT has its own work stream and its own procedures. And if you're lucky, you get a report, maybe build in report server, or if you're lucky, your Power BI report server, not in reporting services. Um, and you have your Excel sheet and all the other stuff. But really what we want uh, to enable is you to securely and and following all the rules to connect to enterprise semantic model, get the data that you need, and then still be able to do your Power BI, mag Power BI magic on top of that. And that's a scenario we don't do today. And why not just only allow you to take data from the enterprise semantic model and add something to it, but why wouldn't we just allow you to do that continuously and say, you know what, I'm gonna mash up this enterprise semantic model that somebody connected to and they added some Excel sheet, and I'm just gonna take that whole thing and then add my own to the top, like an extra cherry on the cake. And then somebody else might come in and say, hmm, that cakes look good, but I'm gonna add some more sugar because I like it more sweet. So I'm just gonna build and build and build. And that way we're gonna build magic together inside of the of your organization while still keeping track where the data came from, when the data was downloaded, what happened during the time that the date from the when the data was taken to when it was reported. So all of that needs to be accounted for. And that's in essence what we're trying to do for composite models. So if you look fast forward a couple uh, couple days from now, uh, how many days tomorrow we'll see. Um, but in essence, we're going to extend the functionality of composite models and we're going to say you can now also take data from SQL Server Analysis Services, Azure Analysis Services, and Power BI. So composite models today already exist. What we're going to do is we're going to add the functionality to connect to Azure Analysis Services, SQL Server Analysis Services, Tableau models, and Power BI, and then still be able to add Excel sheets and whatever other data sources you might have. So not only do we talk about extending the data set, we also allow you to personalize the data set. And this is a, a, a situation, for example, where um, your data set might have been, uh, the enterprise data set from IT might have been built in the US. And, and, you know, I recently moved to the US and it's still crazy that they write the month first and then the day and then the year, right? To any, any normal European being, it's like, what, seriously, how does this work, right? So your report uh, viewers will get confused. So what if that data set is just stored that way, but you could override the formatting of the date because you know your viewers are all in Germany or in the Netherlands. So they expect day, month, year, right? So you could just overwrite the formatting string in your report while it will still take the data from the enterprise semantic model and only that change is applied to your local report. And that's what we call personalization. Okay. Um, so those are the two things, adding more data, personalization, changing things. However, when Power BI report, uh, sorry, when Power BI comes with composite models V next or tomorrow, there will still be a couple limitations. SAP HANA, SAP BW are not in scope. So that situation will not change anytime soon. And SQL Server Analysis Services multidimensional. So if you're using Super Server Analysis Services multidimensional mode, UDM with NDX, it's also not supported. So if you use SQL Server Analysis Services Tabular, Power BI Dataset, and Azure Analysis Services, any of these, you can, using this version, extend and personalize your data. So let's look at a quick example here. A report. Uh, this is a report that is connected to Azure Analysis Services. Um, it's great. One thing you might already have noticed in the July upgrade is that we added an icon, or really we uh, unhidden, we, we made an icon visible that was previously hidden when you connected to a live source like Azure Analysis Services. Um, and that is the icon to see the data set, right? So now if you connect to any source live, um, for example, Azure Analysis Services, you will see the data set. Great, so now you know how the model is built. But this is not a composite model, right? This is just a report. There's nothing crazy about this. And today with composite models, this is where the story ends because I cannot do anything. I'm connected to this live source 
uh, the cube and end of story. I cannot do anything. Well, here in this new version, you can actually go in and say, you know what, I'm going to add my a Power BI data set that somebody else created, it was curated, it was promoted, it was great, I'm going to add it to my report. That's what I do. I add the finance model here. And what I get is another group of tables, a complete data model next to the other one. And as you can see, we highlight them, probably using colors. We're still figuring that one out. But let's say it's using colors, and we see the red group and the green group. So now I have two models. One Power BI data set, one Azure and other services in one report. Am I done? No, of course not. Because what use is it to have two models in my one report, right? I mean, they're they're disjoint, they're not connected at all, so they're kind of useless. Well, I can go a little bit further than that because now they are in Power BI. So I can build relationships between the two. The finance model doesn't have a date table, and it also uses the same customer table that the other mo model uses. So why, why not just be able to just drag and drop the relationship between date and finance and for the customer and the finance model? And we can do that. Remember, these came from two completely disparate sources. And I can even build a measure that uses data from the one model and data from this other model and mesh them up together and present them as one in one calculation. And then, of course, I can use that in the same visual, right? Sales come from the one model. The margin is the measure that I just defined. So for any relationship, any calculation, any measure you make, any visual you make, they don't really care where the data came from, right? All the magic is happening in the modeling engine where we had those two models that you just combined. And the question we get often is, can I only connect two models? Is that all you can do? Well, no, I can just add in an Excel sheet so I get another color and another and another and another. You can keep going. You can build this whole data set based on all of these separate data sets that you combine. You can subselect tables from those data sets and then you end up with this myriad of colors in your, in your Power BI desktop. You can build relationship, you can build measures, you can use them as if they were one data set to begin with. And that's exciting, right? I think so. Um, so, and then, um, you know, you can basically keep keep extending your data set with that. So let's look at uh, how this actually works. Because there's one important thing here to remember, is when you're connected live to AS, to Azure Analysis Services or, or any live source, there's no data model in Power BI, right? We, we only point you to to the source, we only are the visual layer. So we need to do something the moment you connect to more data. So I'll explain what that is in a couple of slides here. First, simple example. I'm gonna use Power BI Desktop and I'm connecting to my enterprise semantic model, which is in Azure Analysis Services in this case. I'm gonna build my report, create some visuals, and I'm gonna publish it. I'm not using composite models here. What I'm getting, a new report that just points to uh, the, the Azure Analysis Services queue, right? This is something you, you know, this is not exciting, this is not new. Now, with composite models tomorrow, I could actually do the same thing and then say, I wanna change something. I wanna add a column. I wanna add a calculated column. I wanna add a measure. I wanna rename a column. That will happen and those changes will be persisted locally in your data model. They will not be pushed up to the central model because you probably, and you should not, have write access there. You only have read access to the central model, so we will not push up the changes there. No, we will make the changes only locally in your Power BI desktop model. That is not the whole data set, by the way. It's not the 10 terabyte data from your, your cube, right? Remember, we're connected to the semantic model live, which means the data sits, sits in the central model. We only get the metadata inside of Power BI now. And any changes you make are applied there. And then you publish. What you end up with is a new report the data model with the changes, which points then to the semantic model. And to make this a little more interesting, I could even go as far as say, you know what, while I'm connecting, I'm also importing some data from Excel. Mesh it up, publish. What I get is a new report, one, a data set, two. And the data set is interesting because it A, has the metadata of the semantic model. 
Two, it points to the semantic model, but it also contains all of the data from the Excel sheet because that's the one you imported, right? So you can see how this evolves into a composite, really hybrid scenario where you get live connected sources that point to something that don't have any data actually in your data set. You get import where the data is in the data set. You get all the relationships, the measures, the customizations that you make. All of that can then be used. And if I do that, if I publish this data set that's now on the screen, right? One that connects to our enterprise semantic model and adds an Excel sheet. And then Jana sees that and says, you know what? That's great, but I'm really missing this one CSV. I don't know why this, this guy, Jay, just missed that one. That's stupid. So what she can do is she can take, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It happens, right? <laughs> she, <laughs> she can take that data set because it's just a Power BI data set. And then she can take that into her Power BI desktop, add that CSV, and then republish it. Effectively, what we think she's doing now, she's chaining from my data set. So in essence, there's now a chain where I started with the composite model, right? I took the data, I added Excel, I published, Yannick came by, she said, yeah, it's almost there. I need something. So she takes the data, adds the CSV, and publishes it back. So you get a whole chain of how data goes for your organization. And that's important because that will allow you to build on top of the work of others while still keeping track of what happened and where the data came from. So lineage view, impact analysis, right? Where did my data came from? Do, does my data did my data uh, come from? And who's dependent on me? is important here. So we're also working on making sure that at any point in time, when I make changes to my original model, I know that Yana actually took mine, made some changes and republished it. So when I make some changes, I need to be aware that she is dependent on my data set. And maybe I'm dependent on another data set as well. So that person needs to know that I'm dependent on them, right? So all of that will be visual. And you can see, oh, I took my data from here, it went to my data set and then somebody else is dependent on me. And that is where the report that the CFO is dependent on. Right? So all of that will be part of composite models. Okay. So let's see if we, um, because that's the end of the slides that yes. I have for composite models. So let's see, can we maybe pause for five minutes for some questions, Jana, while we switch screens? I think that we have a few questions that are very important here about the mm. RLS model, about the SQL and other things. Uh, yep. Catherine, uh, in five minutes, I won't be able to cover the uh, the AI visuals that I've planned. Uh, I think that Jay no should problem. answer. We, we, can, we can make it a little bit longer. It's every time the same, so no, no problem. <laughs> I <laughs> expect it. Okay, then I'll I, switch I guess screens. We have no, no, no power break under uh, one hour or so, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Let's so, just switch sorry. screens and I'll, I'll yes. try to answer a couple of the questions in five minutes and then you can go. Okay. Yes. Um, let's see. I assume for using Azure uh, SSES Tableau on premise semantic model, we need the latest version. Yes, you do. Um, you do, Jochen. And source level RLS support also on roadmap. Yes, it will be there in uh, GA. However, it's very interesting scenarios, right? What happens if I do RLS on the semantic model and what happens if I overwrite that RLS in my Power BI desktop file, right? Who wins and, and when does what win? So that's kind of an interesting scenario. Um, it's got it's slightly complex, but rest assured, we will not publish composite models tomorrow version without good RLS support. Um, so that's there. Um, let's see, which version of SQL Server and other services? Well, the latest 2019 with the latest patches, um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see, uh, RLS, Jochen, again, it's supported. Uh, it will be supported. Let's see, Johannes, it's a very cool story. I from a will add free model by. Yes, so that's an interesting point Johannes brings up here is basically the way I read it is you get a, a lot of sprawl of, of models, right? Everybody will start building their own models. Yes, that's true. So there's a couple of things we can do here. A, you can set up specific permissions to be able to create a composite model and publish it back, right? So if you want, you could say, you're only allowed to publish a composite model back to the service if you have the special permission. That's one. The second one is we could also, and that's also what we're working on, 
is we can also discourage you from creating a composite, a chaining from a composite model, right? So let's say there is an enterprise semantic model uh, published and I uh, have the permissions to create a composite model from that. I added the Excel sheet and I published that. Now in that model, that composite model that I just published, I could set a setting that would stop anybody from taking that data set, extending it further. That, that's the setting we can set on the, on the service. And that basically means that this is the end, this is the end result. Everybody can report on it. That's fine. You can connect to it, but you cannot extend it personal, personalized. <coughs> so basically, you're breaking the chain. That's how we help you bring that number of, of models in control. Um, let's see, are less supported? Yes, same question. Um, I think we should just uh, start on your section, uh, Jana, and I can okay. answer some of the questions in the chat. All right, thank you. So uh, first of all, before we uh, talk about any type of AI, AI uh, visuals, uh, let's uh, cover just what it's predictive analytics, start with algorithm, then we have the artificial intelligence and finally the machine learning. So uh, eventually what is most important in all this type of uh, escalation of how we can uh, analyze our data and get our data insights is the human input and interpretation is always required. And this is what uh, we are going to also be talking about uh, during our uh, 15 minutes or so. So eventually what is artificial in uh, intelligence is uh, demonstrated by machine and often associated with cognitive functions. That means uh, it's creepy that um, what the machine can right now recognize when I'm logging into my device or to other things. Um, so we need to, this is how we, for example, utilize those type of uh, AI capabilities. Uh, while uh, machine learning is an uh, application of the AI that uh, learns the consumer algorithms from experience. For example, if you are asking Power BI a question about your data set, this is a machine learning uh, algorithm that is going to answer those questions and predict uh, the results. Um, I, am, I have chosen to use free data sets. And why do I cho uh, chosen to use free data sets for my samples? I could just use with one once. Not every data set is sufficient enough for machine learning. Sometimes there's just not enough data. Uh, and also, not every data set is clean enough for machine learning. You really need to clean your data set, to parse your data set, and to work with it. And also to examine that there are several ways you can actually uh, take a data set from. So you can from a Kurgle, which is a data competition site, and all the data sets there are free. Uh, Azure had uh, you can download from Azure several sample data sets and you can also go to open data project which has free access to government data from all over the world. So this for example is from Canadian data and uh, Carl's, the, Carl's detailed data set. This is not for machine learning just just to uh, give you some AI on a categorical features and at the end of the day it was taken as a free sample from uh, open data source uh, for a dealership. It's a historical data. So you can find data anywhere. It is not an excuse that I cannot find a good data set in order to not be able to uh, do some uh, results. So let's start with the first one. And this is the exponent visualizations of the and visualizing uh, your data. And this is the quick insight. So quick insight, the best way to do it is when you already have your data set uh, inside the um, Power BI service, uh, you can press uh, for quick insights and get a lot of quick insights that are automated for the data set. This is from our uh, aviation model and uh, for uh, airplanes that was, were delayed and airplanes that were uh, arrived on time. And this is something that the machine is actually predicting for us and trying to find correlations and other things inside the data. So we can choose either of those visualizations or any other visualization and pin them into our, uh, into our dashboard and later on uh, do a more detailed report. So the first capability of some kind of a predictive analytics would be a very simple prediction of a, a straight line uh, of those uh, that of those uh, airplanes that are arriving. So let me get, of course, I will get that here. Let me get to this one. This is um, uh, average delay time for all the flights on each day that was recorded in 2011. So of course it's historical uh, data. So now when we have a graph like this, we can always do something that is uh, with predictive analytics. That means that we are hitting this analytics tab 
and we can have a forecast for the example. This one is a forecast for next seven days delay time. Uh, of course, we can change the uh, confidence level. We can change the uh, seasonality for points uh, and we can change uh, other uh, components in here. So, for example, if we want to make the forecast length not 17 points, but 20 points, let's see how uh, we are changing our prediction. The prediction is changing and it actually is less accurate than we think because we can see those points, uh, in, sorry, more accurate than we think because we can see that those points are following better the trend line. So this is the prediction, while this is the trend line. The bigger, of course, the sample, the better it is the, the prediction. Uh, and this is something that we can do with a simple line chart. You see which visualization I picked? I picked this line chart. Uh, very simple and uh, very straightforward. Um, and it, in addition to the forecast, we can add trend lines that were already uh, added here. Uh, this one uh, is a trend line and we can add minimum, maximum lines and so on in order to eventually, what is our goal, to make a better data-driven decision support. So this will help us. There is, however, another new feature that is uh, analyze and explain the increase. So it is going to explain us the increase with uh, what it thinks that can explain, uh, parameters that it thinks that can explain the increase. We can take each other, uh, we can take each of those graphs that is uh, just working on the same way as the uh, insights works and uh, we can rate it. We can say, oh, this one is useful and we can even um, see more detail and add it to the page. Or we can say that this, for example, uh, is not useful because it doesn't make any sense for us. So then we say poor choice of fields or the description is unclear or poor choice of visual. Let's say poor choice of visual. Uh, it's supposed to change the visual. It didn't do it this way, but <laughs> uh, it usually will change uh, the visual or discard the specific visualization altogether. So this is one way to work with data with our uh, with uh, and with the uh, flights uh, uh, delay model. Uh, let's get back here and explore what was actually behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, this is a very, very simple uh, algorithm of uh, exponential smoothing, which is just above weighted moving average with a specific of alpha. This is what happens mathematically behind the scene. And this is the only availability. Can we change the alpha? No, maybe later. I don't know. Uh, Jay can answer that. But uh, right now, this is the uh, model. <laughs> Things. This is the model that is behind the scenes and it is uh, helps us uh, with seasonality uh, predict uh, accurately enough some of the simplest uh, models that we have got. So uh, how can we explain now the predicted results that the flight delays are going to increase because at the end of the day the idea behind it is to show that flight delays are going to increase because of probably it is October Thanksgiving. We can see here in a very very small font that I should have change that is October 30th and probably the weather is not uh, very good right now and so on. So then it is uh, the, uh, the machine is actually telling that uh, is actually making sense with this type of prediction. But there are other types of prediction that I've seen that the, the, it doesn't make any sense. And this is exactly where we're getting back to the first idea. The input, the human input is the most important factor. We need to teach the machine how to uh, be uh, better and improve. Now, the next step is to design our own uh, prediction analytics on this or any other uh, type of um, of a uh, data. So what we can, what we are uh, able to do, and the first step is to choose the model type. We can do a binary prediction, general classification, regression, and forecasting. And there are uh, others that are probably going to come alone. And uh, with that, this is something that we're doing on the server, uh, on the service. Sorry, we are not. Uh, this is no longer the desktop site. And for some of those ability, you will require um, premium capacity. So um, if you have the premium capacity features, uh, please do uh, train your model and try it out how it works. It's kind of similar if you worked with the AI builder in Power Apps. It's kind of on the same uh, similar, but in Power Apps you've got the visual design, uh, visual and the word recognition, which is a bit different. So whoever remembers my Goose model, this was the one. AI visual Q&A. Uh, this is an answer a natural languages question. Suggest possible question 
and also possible answers, uh, suggestive and spell check, uh, can be trained and improved. And first of all, it's synonyms. Whenever you have those unrecognizable uh, words for table names or for column names, so you can train them all and add those type of synonyms, suggest questions, review the questions, and eventually teach the Q&A. So those are um, two types of visuals that I have desi designed from the Q&A session, uh, and those are suggested questions on our second uh, data set, which is uh, the a data set that is discussing the injuries. It's not a very optimistic one, but perhaps is a, a little relevant for Corona times. So let's go and I hope that I will open the right window. And there we go, but uh, there we go here. So for this uh, specific visual, I have uh, designed several questions. All data, uh, human factor, event type, cluster two, event type. This is not a very uh, human language question, right? But how did I do that? Uh, Power BI basically suggested to me what I might mean by uh, adding it, it from the data from the table from the data that I have got available for myself. So this one is better count incident number by event dateline. So this one is much better and we can of course uh, see uh, the trend line when were the most events uh, there were uh, around uh, I guess uh, April for some reason this is the time that were most events recorded. And of course we can uh, see it by cluster of event types and uh, that um, the Q and A has divided it accordingly. Uh, so, of course, there are also uh, simple questions such as sum of incident number. So we can ask the same question like count events, event dates, and we know that this is 671 dates are inside uh, this uh, data set. Uh, we can always uh, transfer the visual into a uh, regular visual from the Q&A by uh, clicking on this little button. And now we have got not a Q&A, but a regular visual for that. And um, all right, so uh, where we should go uh, next. Uh, after Q&A, there is another visual. Ah, training Q&A. Training Q&A is also an important feature, and I will show it to you on the second data set, on a cars data set. This is a data set that simply contains a lot of uh, cars, their engine, their car weight, their drive wheels, symbols, and so on. This is a, pro um, a topic that I'm a bit passionate about. So when you are asking questions, yes, the Jeep thing, um, when you're asking questions about uh, a specific car, you can uh, always teach your Q&A and review the questions or suggest questions. So right now you can suggest question. Let's say that we are suggesting what is the peak RPM average. So this is our average for this type uh, of question. So now we can add this question for our question repository and save the answer. Of course, we can teach the Q&A to have an answer that is actually a graph. Uh, just a second. This one had a graph as an answer. There we go. So create a bar chart of car uh, by horsepower, by make, uh, by number of cylinders. So you can write it. You can write it several times in several ideas. Save this question and you already have the chart uh, saved and the answer saved inside your Q&A. Field synonyms is something that is created automatically and it was here before and uh, there we go. So it can add more synonyms to uh, the specific uh, uh, mile. For example, a mile per gallon can be also mile per gallon if you are writing it uh, without space. So uh, this helps you to uh, better understand the questions and the answers behind the Q&A. All right. Uh, key influencers. Whoa, what happened here? Key influencers. Now, the key influencers was the first AI uh, powered visualization, and it helps to understand the factors that drive the metric, which factors affect the metric analyzed, and what is the relative importance of those factors. And it does all that automatically. So, uh, what it does is how the combination of facts affect the uh, analyzed metric. It is in the top segment in this window. And in this in in window, it just uh, gets the key influencers by their order. So it can be a categorical metric such as um, 
fatal or not fatal injury in the first data cell or a set or the continuous main metric. The car price explain explained the decrease and increase of car price by model, by number of cylinders, by mile per gallon, and so on. And um, you can also view it by the enabled count to uh, assess even better the impact. So it can be either by impact or by count of the uh, key influencers. And so uh, let's go back to our key influencers. So right here, I chose a very simple model this is the second part that we said. This is uh, explaining the increase or the decrease of the car price based on several influencers. The influencers are number of cylinders, engine side, and carb weight. And now we can see uh, that the number of cylinders is the most uh, effective, um, which was kind of expected. Then engine size and uh, carb weight is slightly behind uh, that, which kind of makes sense. Uh, if we kind of think of 8 to 12 cylinders, car will probably cost more. And uh, uh, top uh, uh, in uh, just a second. Uh, you can also see that there is a little round uh, shape here around, and this was designed from um, uh, enabling the analysis by enabling count. And this is a little one, but you can see how much it is effective actually, and how much of the data it is explaining. So uh, you can play around with this. You can play around only with the uh, show only the values that are influential significantly, and so on. Uh, same idea goes for the top segment. Top segment, as we explained, is several uh, features as they are explained by uh, um, several features that are explaining the segment that are explaining the result. If we are uh, going to a specific segment, choosing it, we will have the overall and the segment type and the uh, explanation of uh, the price and the units that are included in there. If we're going to our first data set, the key influencers on the injuries. This is a more interesting one because there is more of the injuries and this is the categorical one. Now we are not uh, analyzing the increase or decrease in the price, but it's a yes, no question. If the injuries, uh, it's uh, uh, analyzing the fatal and non-fatal injuries uh, there. So um, we can see again the same idea behind uh, the curve and we can now see uh, the only show values that are influencers that it kind of narrows only to the values that are really there is a correlation and they are the most influential values around that. It does all of it automatically and you basically don't need to do anything. As you see the values here and the influence are more the data is more dispersed here because uh, the count is much smaller than it was with the uh, cars uh, as was explained. So uh, give it a try, understand the insight behind you, behind your data. Uh, this is exactly where you need to, uh, when you need to familiarize yourself with the data set and understand uh, if there is, uh, if there are more or less data in a specific segment, what does it mean for you and your business questions. For the decomposition tree, I'm not going to open my presentation. Uh, I'm just going to go through the decomposition tree for the second data, for the first data set about the injuries. We have got, uh, I'm counting the degree of injuries, uh, the number of injuries by degree. So I have the type of injury. It's not a very positive data set, I told you. The event type, the human factor, and the uh, body part. How did I even create this? So I basically went and um, chose, selected the decomposition tree visual. And I have added here the uh, analyze the event type and explain by degree of injury, type of injury, and I can uh, do something else, for example, human factor, and it immediately adds those type of uh, analysis. I can also choose by uh, high and low and uh, values in order to sort this uh, type of data. And uh, I. The decomposition tree, and it's important to understand, is connected to other visuals. So, for example, if I want to know only for the month of April and only the non-fatal, this is what I get. You can see that this is the uh, specific how many, uh, how much I have got, and the number of uh, if, uh, the number of those specific injuries that occurred. Uh, I can always switch it back to percentage. And uh, no, this was supposed to be in percentage, but uh, I can also switch it into percentage from the grand total in order to explain better. Now we are in 1103, so I guess we need our last slide of uh, how do we contact us. 
So after reviewing uh, three of the AI visuals, all the three actually AI visuals, and uh, reviewing what else you can do with like simple predictive analytics model just with a line chart and doing all that in less than 20 minutes. Yeah, I told you I talk fast and I really hope somebody understood something. Uh, I want to uh, do the keep in touch. So first of all, I'll do my part of keep in touch, which is basically the last two parts. Uh, it's aka.ms Power BI training, where you can download the advanced Power BI training and train uh, other people and organize those kind of trainings inside your organization or for the community and give us feedback through the surveys. Uh, there are seven different advanced Power BI trainings, so please do go and download it. And aka.ms uh, diet, which all of you love and uh, train on. Back <laughs> to you, Jay. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. So <laughs> next to that, um, we have, um, of course, the blog where you get your monthly updates. Um, we have the community, which is very active, uh, where you can, you know, ask any question and those kind of things uh, to get answers. Uh, some people from the product team are on there as well. And ideas.powerbi.com is, of course, very important to vote for your ideas. Or if some if something you dreamt up is not there, uh, please add it there. And I know we have not been doing a great job on keeping track of ideas.powerbi.com, but I promise you we'll do better. We already have uh, moved it to a different platform so we can make some change in the future. Um, so we'll we'll do better on, on IDs and, um, and keep that going. Um, so with that, uh, let's just go to the next last slide, which I think is Q&A. Um, but we're already out of time. So I'm not sure if we have uh, you, a specific you, question. You, you, take, take your time. And uh, after that, we have a little discussion round. So it's all OK. <laughs> okay. OK, well, you know. Um, if anybody has any question, <laughs> yeah, feel free yeah. to jump Feel free in. to speak. Jochen? <laughs> Should I raise a question? Yeah, I yeah, can do. Yeah, of course. Uh, do it every time. <laughs> the, yeah, guys, uh, I asked me myself, uh, how that story with the uh, semantic models does fit in the data flow story? Is there some interaction, when to use what, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? So, uh, the answer is uh, I don't at the moment, uh, to be honest, but yeah. we're into we're looking into how that should integrate. So one of the options could be that data flows would just be, um, you know, a, a way to load data from another composite model into another one. Right, so there might be situations where you actually would need that, um, but you know, for now we're we're exploring what that integration would be. It is not it's not something special in the sense that a uh, data flow is just a source for a composite model. So we're not we're not at the moment we're not treating it as something special. But yes, we're looking into what is actually the one plus one equals three here. What is the better together story? All right, thanks. Uh, and maybe the last question on, on the SAP integration, is that something special you have on in, in the scope or are there other other guys working on special HANA and uh, yeah, the BW story uh, connection? No, that's uh, this also part of, of our team. Um, uh -huh. But for now, for composite models, it's it's not part of the scope simply because we have to start somewhere and trying to bowl the whole ocean, ocean in one one feature is not it's not feasible. So yeah. for now, it's not it's not part of the scope here. I but have to say I, I'm already happy with the the composite models in HANA in the relational model um, relational mode. It works fine, mm -hmm. so that's uh, mm -hmm. that's okay. So looking yeah. forward, I think semantic model will be the the greatest and latest since yeah. So 2015, as I said, so. It will it will not be there in in this version of composite model, but you know depending on on what we get during public preview and in terms of feedback, all of that is of course something we can change, right? We just put a stake in the ground to say this is not part of it. Um, yeah. You know it might be part of it in the future. Um, who knows? Maybe this there there's not only the co composite models tomorrow version, but also the composite models the day after tomorrow version, <laughs> <laughs> sure. which which might then include SAP. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all up to us as a group, product team, but also users and community to 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 guide this product to where it needs to be. So if there's a strong requirement to get SAP HANA 
and BW um, support to the same level as all the other things, um, well, tell us, right? And without that, it would not, it would not happen. Yeah, vote for, vote for things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I know it's a bit discouraging if you see things that, you know, have been there for like two years and no real activity on it, on ideas. I know that's the case. Um, but as I said, we're, we're doing our best to clean it up and catch up again. And we are looking at it. What we missed a little bit and we slipped on is, is be active and kind of responsive and closing things and those kind of things. So, you know, okay. believe it or not, there was, for example, no way for us to deduplicate IDs and say, hey, you know, this idea and this idea is actually really the same. So we should close one and match them to, to each other and, and count up the votes. There was nothing like that um, before we moved to the new platform, which only happened a couple of days ago. So, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. OK, other questions? Don't be shy. OK. No questions. Then I will stop the recording after the re after I stopped. We get some questions. I can guarantee it. <laughs>